It's Wednesday, April 19th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. Ralph Yarl's shooting in Kansas City is sparking outrage and more attention on Missouri's laws overseeing self-defense. Legal experts do not believe those statutes will help Andrew Lester escape a conviction. You can't shoot someone if they don't pose a threat, full stop. If no one is threatening you or they're pointing a water gun at you, you can't shoot them. You do have to walk away. Coming up, St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum talks with St. Louis University law professor Anders Walker about how Missouri's laws overseeing self-defense may not apply in the Yarl case. A judge will decide this month whether the effort to oust St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner from office should continue. Attorney General Andrew Bailey says Gardner is mismanaging the office and has reached the threshold to be ousted. Her attorneys say Bailey failed to prove she has willfully neglected her duties and are asking the judge in the case to dismiss it. There are questions around the Attorney General's efforts since Gardner could run again next year. Bailey says removing Gardner is crucial for public safety. I am myopically focused today on restoring the rule of law and finding justice for victims in the city of St. Louis and preventing further victims. And that means this is the action that I have the legal authority to take to fulfill those principles and achieve those goals. A trial would start in late September if the case is allowed to continue. The issues surrounding the St. Louis Circuit Attorney are prompting a group of mayors in the region to call on state lawmakers to combine the county and city prosecuting attorney offices. The mayors of Bridgeton, Brentwood, Manchester, and Wildwood say the move would prosecute crime more efficiently and consolidate resources. Their call comes as St. Louis's circuit attorney is accused of office mismanagement. The joint statement from the mayors says failing to prosecute criminals in any of the area's municipalities affects the safety of the entire region. The Post-Dispatch reports the group also wants state lawmakers to implement harsher penalties for several crimes, including illegal firearms possession, car thefts, and break-ins. Members of the newly elected St. Louis Board of Aldermen are promising cooperation as they serve residents of the city. The aldermen took their oaths of office yesterday, and as St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Littman reports, it did not take long for internal conflicts to emerge. Board President Megan Green alluded to potential clashes in an inaugural speech to her colleagues, supporters, and other elected officials. Our city is counting on you to model productive disagreement and compromise. But disagreements in the chamber turned nasty quickly. Green and Mayor Tashara Jones both backed a challenger to 12th Ward Alderwoman Sharon Tyus. Tyus took the move personally and pledged to come for both women. When Green interrupted her, Tyus erupted. Do you have guests that you are I am. This is my guest want me to say this. Now what about that? You are being a white Becky. Sit down and listen. Tyus was also sharply critical of new rules that emphasize internal democracy over seniority for board leadership. She says the changes leave residents who live north of Page with less power. I'm Rachel Lipman, St. Louis Public Radio. The Missouri House has given initial approval to a budget bill with nearly $860 million to expand three sections of Interstate 70. But the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee has unveiled a proposal to widen the entire interstate in Missouri. That would cost nearly $3 billion. Governor Mike Parson first pitched the partial widening plan during his State of the State address. Lanes would be added in St. Louis, Columbia, and Kansas City. House Budget Chair Cody Smith says that bill also contains funding to improve other roads. We're doing a lot of good things here with this bill, Mr. Speaker, investing heavily into our infrastructure and getting local participation in many cases. House funding for I-70 will face challenges in the Senate since the Appropriations Committee now has a larger plan. Clinics in Missouri providing gender-affirming care to transgender people are accepting as many new patients as possible before the end of the month. That's when an emergency regulation from Attorney General Andrew Bailey places limitations on who can get hormones, surgery, and other medical interventions. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports. Bailey says he can put the restrictions in place because gender-affirming care is experimental, acclaimed doctors and activists dispute. Parts of the rule do not immediately apply to those already getting care. Planned Parenthood officials say its Missouri clinics have scheduled more than 200 new patients this week. Harley Cameron had their first appointment at the organization's Central West End Clinic on Monday. 
They were planning to wait to start low-dose hormones, but say they needed to take action quickly. This was the best option for me to make sure that I'm able to have the capability to receive the care that will make me comfortable in my body. The rule expires in February. It prohibits patients from receiving gender-affirming medical care without 15 hours of therapy and three consecutive years of gender dysphoria. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. A federal grand jury has indicted three St. Louis residents on charges of illegally spreading pro-Russian propaganda and sowing discord across Missouri and Florida through the African People's Socialist Party. The indictment alleges the accused acted as illegal agents of the Russian government without notifying the U.S. Attorney General. They are also charged with conspiring to have U.S. citizens act as illegal agents. Members of the party cannot immediately be reached for comment. The indictment comes months after the FBI raided the party's St. Louis office. Last week's shooting of 16-year-old African-American Ralph Yarl in Kansas City by an 84-year-old white man is sparking outrage throughout the country. Andrew Lester is facing felony charges. St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum spoke with St. Louis University Law School professor Anders Walker about how Missouri's Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground laws likely won't help Lester. The Castle Doctrine is a rule that if you are in your home and someone threatens you by coming in, you don't have to run out the back door. You can use lethal force to stop an intruder. And what is the difference between Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground? Well, not much. They're basically the same rule. Uh, You don't have to run away. If someone is threatening you, stand your ground applies outside your home. That could apply in the street. If someone puts a gun in your face, you can shoot them. You don't have to say, could I run away? If you're in your home, you don't have to run out the back door. Same basic idea. You have a little more protection in your home, but otherwise it's very similar. Most states have either a stand-your-ground law or a castle doctrine or a mixture of both. But there are some states that don't have either, and they have what's called a duty to retreat. So that was the old rule, and the old rule was you can use lethal force if you need to, if you absolutely have to use lethal force to prevent serious injury or death to yourself or someone else. If you don't need to, then you need to run away. You need to retreat. You need to close the door. You need to drive somewhere else. States started to say, well, that isn't right. If you're in your home, you shouldn't have to run out the back door. And then states started to say, you know, even if you're on the street and someone points a gun at you, you shouldn't have to make the split-second decision, can I safely run away? You should be able to stand your ground. And so states like Missouri have both rules, and I think it might break down politically. I think it's more popular among conservatives to stand your ground, and I think the Second Amendment generally is more popular among conservatives. It seems like these types of laws have been in place for literally centuries, but it seems like it was a relatively recent development that states adopted castle doctrine, stand your ground. I think so. I think a lot of it is political. Uh, Even the old self-defense rule, which dates back to ancient English common law, was you can use lethal force to defend yourself if your life is at risk. You can't use it if it's not necessary. You can't shoot people who do not threaten you. And a lot of it is political theater. A lot of it, I think, is um, not really that different. You can't shoot someone if they don't pose a threat, full stop. If no one is threatening you or they're pointing a water gun at you, you can't shoot them. You do have to walk away. And I think that gets to the Kansas City example where from the facts of the case so far, a 16-year-old went up to somebody's door, rang the doorbell, thought it was somebody else's house, and then was shot twice. And what I've heard from people is neither Castle Doctrine nor Stand Your Ground would apply because the 16-year-old Ralph Jarl did not pose an imminent danger to this person. I think that's right. Now, a defense attorney would argue this was late at night. Uh, This was an older gentleman who may have been afraid. Maybe it was an aggressive knock. We don't know. However, in cases like this before, and there have been two, one in Louisiana, one in South Carolina, homeowners shot trick-or-treaters. Both were prosecuted. Under the theory, if someone rings your doorbell or knocks on your door, you don't have to answer. If you're afraid, just stay in your house. Don't shoot unless they kick in the door because it might be a kid. 
It seems that if Andrew Lester, the man who was charged in the Ralph Yarl shooting, ends up being convicted by a jury and either the stand your ground or castle doctrine defenses really just don't fly. It seems that that would showcase that there are limits to both of those things and that does not just give somebody an unlimited right to shoot somebody. Yeah, I think that's right. If someone rings your doorbell in the middle of the night or knocks, don't shoot. Wait. See what happens. If they kick in the door, then I think you're uh, okay to use lethal force. So this could be a test case even if, well, even if the jury votes to acquit, it's still going to be a test case because there's going to be a huge amount of controversy and media attention. So we'll just wait to see. I suspect that uh, the gentleman is going to go to jail. That was St. Louis University law professor Anders Walker speaking with St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum about Missouri's laws overseeing self-defense. Our Fred Ehrlich edited that report. Ashley Lissenby is the news director of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.